文豪会話。Hello everyone, welcome back to our English conversation program. How are you? I hope you're fine. Today I'm very happy to invite you to join us again for the guest hour. Hi everybody, this is Beth Higgins. It's certainly a pleasure to be here with you and to introduce our guest. Mrs. Ellen Rushko, who is an educational information officer of the Japan and United States Educational Commission. Let's see what she has to say. Welcome to our program, Mrs. Rushko. Thank you. I'm pleased to be invited. Hello, everyone. Well, may I begin by asking when you came to Japan、uh, first, and probably、uh, why? <laughs> I came to Japan. It's nearly 13 years ago,、mm-hmm. and I came with the intention of remaining here for one year. And my initial purpose、um, was really not my my purpose, but、uh, my my grandmother, who had immigrated to the United States from Japan, felt it was a sin that I couldn't speak Japanese, and therefore she asked that I spend a year here.、Mm-hmm. To acquire Japanese language proficiency. After a year in Japan, I was offered a position at the commission, and am therefore still in Japan. Does it mean then you are now fluent in Japanese? Not quite. <laughs> <laughs> and though Beth has just mentioned that you、uh, work for the. In Japan, the United States Educational Commission.、Uh, but can I ask you、uh, what you are actually doing? What sort of work you do? I see. The commission has two basic tasks.、Mm-hmm. One is administering the grant program,、mm-hmm. the Fulbright grant program, and the other task is、uh, maintaining what is called the Educational Information Service. Mm-hmm. And I am responsible for the Educational Information Service, which is、um, a public service、mm-hmm. open to anyone interested in study or any kind of educational opportunity in the United States.、Mm-hmm. Um, I'd like to ask you something about the name. Certainly, the name, the Fulbright Commission, is well known, but I'm a bit confused. Has this name been changed? To Japan United States Educational Commission, or how does this work? I see. The, the official title of the commission is the Japan United States Educational Commission. I see. But because the official title is so long, everyone refers to the program as the Fulbright Program, and of course Senator Fulbright was the、uh, founder of the program. So throughout the world, each commission has very long titles, but in almost all of the country. Um, citizens of the country or Americans refer to the program as the Fulbright program. May I ask you when it was founded?、Uh, the program in Japan began in 1951. I see.、Mm-hmm. And、uh, are you also、uh, working for the East West Center? That's right. The commission serves as the Japan office for the East West Center. Mm-hmm. And of course, the center is located in Hawaii. I see. And、uh, can you tell us a bit more about、uh, this center? I mean, the East West Center.、Uh, what are some of the activities,、uh, or、uh, in what way you are helping、uh, the activities of the center? It's it's quite difficult to to describe the center、mm-hmm. because、um, it's not a university.、Mm-hmm. It's not a research center. It's not a think tank. It's really a combination of all of these、oh. kinds of activities. Does it offer any grants or scholarships to、mm-hmm. Japanese students? Yes.、Um, in fact, each year between 80 and 90 Japanese go to the center. Out of that number, five or six go for graduate study. What do you mean by they go and study at the center? You mean the center back in Hawaii? It, That's right. Because if one goes to the center as a student, I see, on a grant, then one is affiliated with the center, but does degree work at the University of Hawaii because the center is located adjacent to the university campus. 
Well, I see. And could you explain exactly what the East-West Center does itself? Is it just a research organization? Well, it conducts many, many seminars and workshops and conferences and joint meetings. Um, it facilitates uh, collaborative research among graduate students or amongst very senior people. It does a variety of things. And one of the things that is unique about it is, is that from the very beginning, the intention of the center was to uh, conduct these joint activities with various countries in Asia and the Pacific. And rather than having the center plan or map out a project, individuals from various countries are asked to join from the earliest stages. And therefore, it's very difficult to fill up the center and to explain. I see. Well, I'd like to turn um, a little bit um, to the type of uh, thing you were interested uh, in when you were in college. I think your work's very important now, but I wonder, have you always wanted to do this? Did you want to do this when you were a student? Oh, I, um, like a typical American student, I changed my mind several times <laughs> as an undergraduate and finally decided on majoring in psychology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I did that, and then immediately after graduating, I continued on to graduate school. And in graduate school, I again majored in psychology. And what area of psychology? Uh, primarily counseling and rehabilitation. I see. And uh, did you do anything with it? Well, um, through internships and on-the-job training, I worked at a state mental institution for adults, and I worked at a mentally... Uh, a hospital for the mentally retarded, um, mostly children, and really did a variety of things um, during my early career. I see. You said state mental institution. Which state? The state of Hawaii. I see. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Mrs. Mushko, in what way did you find your psychology background uh, helpful for your current work? Well, I, I forgot to explain that after working in the state mental institution, I worked at the University of Hawaii Student Counseling Center. Mm -hmm. And we did everything from vocational counseling to personal counseling. And I guess um, what binds all of my different jobs is that I've always liked and wanted to work with people. Mm -hmm. And uh, working with people rather than... Um, working with ideas or things like an engineer might. Mm -hmm. And I guess that still holds true for my present job. Um, speaking of your present job, you said you liked working with um, people. I'd like to ask you specifically for you, what's the most rewarding aspect of your work? Well, it's... <laughs> the, the results are not clear-cut, or they don't come very quickly, but it's very rewarding to see very bright and highly motivated individuals um, pursue study abroad or to pursue research abroad and to return and to see them sort of blossom in different ways. <laughs> uh, Mrs. Mashiko, you also seem to be involved in uh, JAFSA or NAFSA. Uh, can you tell us something about these organizations? Probably our listeners are wondering what they stand for to I begin see. with. Now, NAFSA is an organization based in the United States, and JAFSA is an organization based in Japan. Mm -hmm. NAFSA is the National Association for Foreign Student Affairs, and JAFSA is the J Japanese Association for Foreign Student Affairs. The members are all individuals who are committed to making life and study or research in the respective countries countries comfortable for students and scholars. Our concern is primarily with foreign students and scholars. So the members include, for example, teachers of English or Japanese as a foreign language, admissions officers, foreign student, uh, foreign student advisors, uh, various individuals, including faculty members, mm -hmm. who, are, who are really committed to helping these individuals. And how are they uh, financially assisted? Well, these organizations are independent nonprofit organizations uh, that are supported primarily by membership fees. 
And members really give a lot of their time on a voluntary basis so that uh, the organizations are, in a sense, really organizations of volunteers. I see. Mm. If you don't mind, um, I'd like to turn uh, back a bit to uh, your experience in Hawaii. You grew up there, right? That's right. Well, um, everybody knows that many, many Japanese tourists <laughs> these days uh, go to Hawaii, and of course it's a famous uh, spot for American tourists as well. And some people even go so far as to say that um, Hawaii is perhaps the end of America and the, or the end, uh, beginning of Japan or vice versa, so mm-hmm. I say anyway that it's some kind of a mix. Do you have any comment about um, Hawaii in any way, culturally or linguistically or in any other sense? Well, Hawaii is really a quite a unique place, and in a sense, it's like New York City or Alaska in the United States. I think these three places are unique in the United States. Hawaii is, is a great mix. It, it sounds quite trite, but it really is a mix. And, for example, there's a strong movement now in Hawaii to preserve Hawaiian traditions and mm-hmm. the Hawaiian heritage. And given the shifting uh, patterns in the population, I think it's quite misleading to say that uh, Hawaii and uh, Hawaii is the beginning or the end of Japan. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you said it's a mix. A mix of what? A mix of various... Um, cultural backgrounds. Uh, Mm -hmm. Of course, there are many Caucasians Mm -hmm. and Asian Americans and an increasing number of South Pacific Islanders. Mm -hmm. Well, back to talking about your Japanese learning experiences. This is embarrassing. (laughs) Well, let me just turn the tables around as our listeners are having a hard time studying English. And uh, can you just tell us how you you learn to either speak or read Japanese. Um, any, can you just share some of your experiences uh, with us? Well, I, I took Japanese for two years mm-hmm. in college, like uh, ja- your Japanese students take English. English and I yeah. wasn't a very good student. <laughs> I didn't attend class <laughs> faithfully. And I remember studying kanji mm-hmm. uh, frantically in the library before examinations. And I I really didn't give it serious thought Mm -hmm. until, by chance, I began taking Japanese classical dance lessons, Mm -hmm. Nihonbuyo. Mm -hmm. And it became very frustrating that I could not understand um, what was being said or sung or what the backgrounds of the respective dances were. And so for, for my first year in Japan, it was total immersion. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't live or work with individuals who spoke English all of the time. Mm-hmm. What do you mean by total immersion? Probably our listeners doesn't, they don't understand what you mean by that. Well, by total immersion, I mean I lived in a typical Japanese apartment, and I went to Sento every night, uh-huh. and there were no so-called uh, American supermarkets in uh-huh. the neighborhood. And so I had to learn the name of fish and how to purchase the fish. And all of my friends, um, or my acquaintances, Mm -hmm. were Japanese who purposely refused to speak English to me. Mm. Well, Mrs. Mashiko, I'm sorry to say, but that's all the time we have today. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I'm sure our listeners want to hear more about your interesting experiences. So would you mind coming over again next Saturday? Certainly. Everybody, this concludes today's guest hour. So long. Bye for now. Bye. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our English conversation program. How are you doing today? I hope you're fine. Since this is Saturday, we are very delighted to have you join us again for the second half of this month's guest hour. Hi, everyone. It's certainly nice to be back and to welcome Mrs. Ellen Mashko from the Japan United States Educational Commission. We'll continue our discussion with hints for study abroad. I'm sure you'll find it beneficial. A special welcome to our program, Mrs. Mashko. Thank you for having me back. 
Um, before asking you more questions, let me briefly sum up what we talked about for the benefit of those who were unable to join us last week. First, um, Mrs. Mersko is the Educational Information Officer of the Japan United States Educational Commission, popularly referred to as the Fulbright Commission. She majored in psychology in college and has been living and working in Japan for the past 13 years, assisting students who would like to study abroad. It's certainly delightful to have you with us again. Well, it's nice to be back again, too. Thank you for coming. Um, I think the subject that we'd like to focus on today is some practical hints or advice for students going abroad, um, particularly to the United States. And first of all, I'd like to ask, what are some of the biggest problems that Japanese students have when they go to study in the United States? Well, you've asked a good question, a question that I'm frequently asked. Before we get into problems, I might add that when we say Japanese students, mm -hmm. let me say that there are approximately 14,000 students in the United States, 14,000 Japanese students alone. And among this group are individuals anywhere from, oh, I, you know, I would say 17 to 45. And so we're really not talking only about uh, the usual uh, university student who is between 18 and 22. Uh, rather than focusing on problems, perhaps I should say that from our viewpoint mm -hmm. at the Commission in helping anyone who wants to study in the United States is that it's, it's often quite difficult to assist people because they do not have clear goals in mind. And because they don't have clear goals in mind, it's, it's very difficult, or should I say impossible, to give them the kind of information they're, they're looking for. So you mean in the process of preparation, there are a lot of things that they can do on their part. And uh, for instance, uh, what is most important thing is to have a specific idea of what uh, they uh, want to do, with a either long-term or short-term uh, uh, prospect. Mm -hmm. uh, is that what you mean? That's right. Um, I think that oftentimes individuals do not consider their long and short-term educational uh, career mm -hmm. or personal goals in thinking about going to the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, rather, they hope to begin the admissions process immediately and to obtain the proper visa, and to travel to the United States, which leads, I think, to many people going to the United States and then returning with uh, unfulfilled goals, mm -hmm. should I say? First of all, you said that the students should define their goals, but um, to um, ask about practical uh, questions once they have defined those goals, mm -hmm. when they want to study, um, of course, they need uh, good information about the school they're going to, the kind of uh, teaching staff it has, mm -hmm. uh, financial assistance, and so on. Um, what advice would you give to the listeners about making um, inquiries for information of that sort? And also, what kind of service is offered through your office? Well, let's, let me say that individuals who have gone through this soul searching process yes. should consider their educational background and their abilities um, their financial resources and of course their English language proficiency mm -hmm. and once they have have some grasp of the, where they are on these three factors um, they're certainly welcome to come to our office which is open to the public we serve anyone who is interested in going to the United States including students or parents, um, people who are already employed, uh, teachers, um, researchers, uh, individuals from other countries of the world. Uh, we provide information and guidance, uh, guidance in group and individual sessions mm -hmm. regularly. Our library is open and we do not charge for any of our services. When we want to make any uh, inquiries, uh, do you mean that then we have to call your office first for making appointments? Well, 
Uh, not necessarily. If you would like to join a group counseling session or to meet with a counselor individually, mm -hmm. then we suggest that you call. But oftentimes we encourage people to visit the library and to use it like any other library. And for that purpose, no appointment is necessary. You uh, mentioned the library. What kind of a library is it? Well, it's not a huge library, but we have the catalogs for almost all of the junior colleges, four-year colleges, universities, and graduate schools in the United States. And we have a collection of about, I would say, perhaps nearly a thousand specialized directories, uh, for example, School of Architecture, uh, graduate programs in engineering, and directories of that sort that help people uh, select universities to which they might apply. I see. <laughs> and what about those who live um, outside Tokyo? Uh, where would you suggest they go for uh, making uh, similar inquiries? Uh, would you suggest to go to American Center branch or...? Well, the American centers in Sapporo and Nagoya, mm -hmm. Kyoto, Osaka, Fukuoka, and Naha have limited collections of resource materials. Mm -hmm. And one has free access, of course, to these materials. But if one needs uh, further information or guidance of any sort, mm -hmm. then all of these individuals either telephone or write to her office. Mm -hmm. Wait, they write to your office. Uh, can you send them catalogs, or how do they go about getting information by mail? Well, we, we can't send catalogs, but all of the American centers have what are called microfiche collections in which um, catalogs are, are on film, and people can go to these centers to, to review catalogs mm -hmm. this way. Oh, Ms. Mashko, do you have any comment on the uh, level of English proficiency uh, required to go to an American college, since uh, I'm sure our listeners are so much concerned <laughs> with this problem of English language? I perhaps um, should say that colleges and universities all have different requirements. Mm -hmm. And even within a given university, uh, different departments have different requirements. Unlike perhaps universities in Japan, there are no real cutoff scores or passing scores. Sometimes universities that have many, many applicants will say, we request that you submit a TOEFL score above 550. But there are other factors that are considered in the admissions process. You mentioned uh, TOEFL. I'm sure some of our listeners know that, but probably others do not. Could you um, tell us what that stands for? TOEFL is the test of English as a foreign language. It's a standardized English test that is required by almost all of the colleges and universities in the United States. I see. So a student might want to try to study to pass that test. It would be a first realistic measure. That's right. And one can take the test as many times as he or she wishes. Uh, so perhaps if some of our listeners have plans three or four or five years down the road, they might wish to take the test quite soon to, to check what their current level of English is. Can you tell us, or do you have any idea, uh, how good they have to be uh, in terms of their uh, score? Well, the full score on TOEFL is 700. Mm -hmm. for, at the undergraduate level, for the social sciences, sciences and humanities, I would say that 550 mm -hmm. would be a fairly strong score. In the natural and applied sciences, perhaps 520 or 30. At the graduate level, particularly at the very competitive universities, Japanese are all scoring in the 600s. 600s. And in terms of language ability, of course, there are different functions of language. There's speaking and listening or comprehension and reading and writing. Um, do you have any particular comment on about the particular skills involved? Well, I think that 
in in speaking with many many Japanese who are interested in study abroad, there's there's such great interest or concern about being able to converse in English, mm-hmm. and we always stress the need for strong reading and writing skills, especially. Um, or well, even at the undergraduate level, for example, the reading assignments are very heavy, and there are many tests to be written and papers to be submitted. And I think that oftentimes these two areas, reading and writing, are overlooked. Mm-hmm. I see. So they should neglect any skills. That's right. <laughs> and American professors are more demanding, I'm sure, <laughs> than Japanese. To speak again about.、Um, Getting information about going、um, abroad.、Um, do you suggest writing directly to a school itself that a student、uh, would like to go to, or any suggestions about how to ask for information directly on a student's or a prospective student side? Well, there are nearly three thousand institutions in the United States, so it's very difficult if one doesn't narrow. His or her choice is down, either by geographic area or by the type of environment. Did、uh, you say three thousand? That's right. So if you write a letter every day, <laughs> that'll take ten <laughs> years to get that. Well, that's、And、not a lot of work. Yes. We we try very hard to help individuals to to narrow down their preferences,、uh, so that we can s- suggest, for example. Twenty or thirty institutions which they might look at, and out of that number, perhaps write to ten institutions for further information. And this writing is、uh, done by the student side, or do you assist them with that? Well, our basic philosophy is that if anyone is interested in studying abroad, that they that be begin to be independent and to be self reliant as early as possible. And we provide guidance and information, but everyone is expected to do all of his or her own correspondence. Well, probably you have just、uh, answered、uh, partially to this question, but do you think there is such a thing as a particular personality type uh, uh, which uh, easily makes the、uh, transition to American college life? Well, rather than perhaps personality, I would say there are per- perhaps traits or characteristics that、mm-hmm. make it easier or more difficult to to adapt to another culture. But certainly, independence、mm-hmm. and self reliance,、mm-hmm. flexibility,、mm-hmm. and resourcefulness are important. I don't want to focus on the negative, but you said there are some things that make it more difficult to have、uh, any specific. Um, trait in mind. Well, I've observed that if an individual is not communicative in his or her, her own native language, then the transition to another culture, whether it be simply language fluency or living,、um, there's a great deal of difference. Well, Mrs. Mashiko,、uh, my job seems to be always to say that that's all the time we have today, <laughs> and、uh, I'm sorry, but uh, uh, there is no more time time left. And thanks very much indeed for being with us, and I'm sure our listeners have found your talk really helpful. Thank you very much, everybody. This concludes today's guest hour. So long. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. 担当は東郷克明先生。お相手は別日銀座さん。